So why don't we go ahead and get started? Welcome, everybody. I'm John Haig. I'm the co-director of the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government here at the Kennedy School. Um, I wanted to say thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, it is, I know, a busy time here at, at the Kennedy School. I know all of our students are in the midst of taking finals, so uh, doubly appreciate your willingness to take time to listen in. Um, we have a terrific, terrific program today. Um, the title is Encouraging Smart Drinking, Conversations with the CEO of AB InBev. Um, and just so you know, AB InBev is the world's largest beer company. Um, you know, in the United States, we tend to think of uh, various uh, companies that are actually smaller uh, than InBev. So with that, I'm going to introduce Miriam Sadibi. We have a, a significant number of people here uh, on a panel. Uh, we'll uh, turn it over to Miriam and uh, Svenja Kirch to, to introduce them. Uh, just a little bit of background about Miriam. She's been a senior fellow and a research fellow here at the center uh, for a number of years. Uh, she is one of the world's leading experts on brands and brands in particular that drive health, health outcomes uh, and thinking about mass behavioral change. Many of our students are, are fascinated by uh, behavioral economics these days. Well, that's a good, a good lesson to think about. Um, she was with Unilever before, uh, before this and uh, introduced an interesting and relatively simple um, health solution that has vastly manifest uh, implications for health and that's hand washing. Um, and she gave a, a 2014 TED talk on the simple power of hand washing. Um, and she's worked in multiple countries, 20 countries. She has a, she's from Mali. Uh, she has a doctorate in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a master's in water and white waste engineering from Lober. Lowborough University in the UK. Um, and like I said, we're very happy that she's here as a, um, a research fellow at the center. Um, and she was just named uh, by New African Magazine as one of the mo 100 most influential Africans in 2021. I haven't had a chance, Miriam, to congratulate you on that, but congratulations for that recognition. I think that's terrific. Um, and then we also have with us Svenja Kirch, who has been working uh, with Miriam and Svenja, I am fortunate to say has been one of our, my all-star students at various times uh, and is an MPP student who will be graduating um, in the spring 2022. So um, welcome to Miriam and Svenja. I will turn it over to you to let you introduce uh, this all-star cast of individuals that have joined us. Thank you so much, um, John. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, to be hosting this fascinating conversation. Um, ending the year on a high, um, should I say that, on, you know, getting us to think about inspirational and, and what we could do in terms of smart drinking. Um, and we are really pleased today to have our guest, uh, who's actually our chief guest, who's uh, Michelle Ducaris. Michelle Ducaris is the ABM Bev CEO since the 1st of July, 2021. Ducaris joined ABM Bev in 1996 and held a number of commercial operations role in Latin America before moving to Asia where he led ABM Bev's China and Asia Pacific operation for seven years. So he comes with a lot of experience having run internally um, this company in various roles. And today we're gonna be discussing what it actually takes to embed a smart drinking into the business model and make it sustainable so that we can actually drive and lead the way in terms of smart drinking um, and start thinking about how is it even possible for beer brands to be able to inspire more responsible drinking. So um, a round of applause for our, our, our chief guest. Also joined in this panel today, we will have um, Jane Nelson. Um, Jane Nelson is the founding director of the Corporate Responsibility Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School. And she's a non-resident senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. She also serves as the co-chair at the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Food Systems Innovation. She's authored and co-authored five books and over hundred publications on corporate responsibility, public private partnerships and the private sector's role in sustainable development. Um, Svenja, do you want to introduce Professor Leslie Crutchfield and Dr. Bill de Young? Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this event. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome also one of our panelists, Professor Leslie Crutchfield. Um, she is the Executive Director of the Corporate Social Responsibility and Adjunct Professor at Georgetown's McDonough School of Business. Leslie brings more than 25 years of experience in the social sector and has authored three best-selling books, including How Change Happens, Why Some Social Movements Succeed While Others Don't. Her case studies, articles, and commentary have been 
have appeared in publications such as Fortune, Harvard Business Review, and Stanford Social Innovation Review. Beyond that, I'm also very delighted to welcome Dr. Bill Young as a panelist. He is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the Boston University School of Public Health. De Young's research covers multiple areas in the field of public health, including alcohol and tobacco control, health communications, and health promotion. In 2014, he co-authored a review article that found that the U.S. legal drinking age of 21 had saved lives since it was raised to that level as a result of a law passed in 1984. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Miriam, uh, to get us started on this exciting conversation. Well, thank you very much. So what I'll do is I just want to set the stage a bit around these conversations around smart drinking. Um, as John has mentioned, one of the areas that's fascinating to me is, and having spent my entire career at the intersection of marketing and public health. So John has mentioned, I have a doctorate in public health. I've spent you know, a, a lot of time thinking about why would people wash their hands and why they shouldn't or why they don't wash their hands. And then I spent 15 years in probably one of the biggest um, FMCG and leaders in marketing. Um, basically in, in, in their soap category, thinking about how would you embed hand washing with soap as part of their marketing strategy. So this intersection of marketing and public health is absolutely fascinating to me. And then I always realized very, very quickly on that the, the, the way forward was very much around embedding this into the business model and tackling this from a brand level perspective. So I've spent quite a lot of time as a marketeer. Indeed, I'm even thinking about creating a new discipline, which I'm calling marketing for public health in terms of um, you know, infusing ethics and values in the way marketing is actually being led. So what I want to do today is just set the stage on this particular public health issues and therefore what can business model and this particular business model, which is being led today by one of the, the, the world's largest beer company, but also has some of our favorite brands around the world, right? So if you look and you think about where we stand in terms of the public health issue, you know, alcohol abuse, is a real public health issue. It causes over 3 million deaths worldwide, right? It, it accounts to over 5% of the global burden of disease and, and, and injury. If you think about alcohol, it causes twice as many deaths as tuberculosis, seven times more than malaria, and over 21 times more than measles. Um, and particularly of interest is obviously the countries that are actually um, where alcohol consumption increases as economic development increases. And over, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, of, obviously indirect uh, and intentional injuries that are happening as a way, um, you know, as an afterthought of alcohol and alcohol uh, consumption. Um, and intentional injuries such as road traffic injuries, but also intentional injuries like suicide and murder. So it's a real public health issue. And I, you know, I, I talk about this um, with all the seriousness that comes with the professor title that I was just given at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as a professor of the practice, thinking about what can we do with public health. And I thought, wow, this is serious that you could actually rethink and sit from you know, the, the world's largest beer company and think about what your role has been, but what your role can be and what changes you're making in terms of this, this transformation of business model that you're now setting in stage. So for me, I think about beer brands and I think about the intersection and the opportunity that you have when you're talking to the consumers, right? And for me, beer brands are important partners in addressing the scale of this public health issue because they invest significantly in messaging to the consumers at a large scale and they understand the, the consumer. So I want to pause and think about the role of alcohol brands in contributing to the reduction of harmful use of alcohol. And what we've put together is a very simple film, which I thought was quite befitting because we've been helping and thinking about what you could do to transform social norms marketing as a proper core competencies that every marketeer should have when they're thinking about how to embed smart drinking. So I'm just going to share um, this really small film that actually talks about why we need to think about social norms and why social norms become so critical as what a marketeer is doing. Because a marketeer tends to think very much about an individual behavior. But thinking about social norm marketing gives you a chance to think about um, societal influences that are also having a direct impact and influences on, on, on individual behavior. So please um, welcome this the small film, which is going to last a minute In and 1938, a half. De Beers, the diamond company, launched a Diamond is Forever campaign. That campaign convinced men that diamonds are the ultimate gift of love. And women, that there is no romance sans diamonds. 
the campaign that still runs strong changed the narrative around the social norm of engagements, elevated diamonds from a precious stone to a statement of love, made De Beers very successful. Social norms marketing influences consumer behaviors and builds purposeful brands. It can also reduce harmful use of alcohol while building brand love. The alcohol category has often changed social norms. Michelob made a new drinking occasion. Our beers eliminated excuses to drunk driving, encouraged eating before drinking, and alternating drinks with water. Our social norms marketing competition has inspired brands to create campaigns with deep local insights. We need many more of these campaigns, better funded and consistently deployed, and used for responsible category and brand growth. This toolkit helps teams embed social norms marketing into core brand architecture. With the toolkit, brands build consistent business growth and fully live their purpose. This will support AB InBev's smart drinking vision by connecting the right brands to the right messaging, ensuring that campaigns connect to the purpose. With interesting cases in theory, the toolkit gives our marketers technical skills and knowledge to design inspiring campaigns that influence consumer social norms. While our brands seek to reduce GBV, underage drinking, binge drinking, and drunk driving, this toolkit gives them the techniques and inspirations to affect those changes. The first part of the toolkit explains the 5M framework that takes marketers from understanding social norms at a beer category level to developing relevant measurement metrics. The latter half focuses on how to amplify impact through partnerships advocacy, and internal support. Social norms marketing capabilities strengthen our brands and support our reputation as a leading voice of responsible growth. In and I mean, if you think about it, hopefully you've recognized some of the, your favorite brands in here. Um, and some of the favorite brands that uh, you know we've talked about is, for example, the Aguila brand. You know, a brand that, you know, is, is synonymous, is, is it's absolutely uh, fantastically well known in Colombia. And that is actually thinking about how you can live responsibly and you can tackle, um, you know, what, what we've been talking about in terms of harmful use of alcohol. So, for example, making sure that you, you, you're giving a glass of water or a bottle of water and you're partnering with water companies, for example, that you are making sure, for example, that you are, you know, you're making sure that people have access to food and they can get access, you know, they, you know for example, have access to to a pizza, for example, at a moment where they're drinking, um, you know, making sure that they get a, a cab home and an Uber home at the time of, of that, of, of, you know, if you've drunk too much. So I think for us, one of the interesting things here was how do you get the kind of equity and size that a brand like Aguila has in Colombia and start thinking about what is possible to be able to change some of this harmful use of alcohol so that, you know, you can embed responsibly what to do. And, and um, I'm, you know, and for example, example, in the US, you're thinking about Budweiser. Budweiser is, again, a very big brand that's been thinking um, when you least expect it, for example, in the Super Bowl, is to start thinking about places where, you know, you would have to have a Budweiser with a glass of water. So, and they call this campaign Drinkweiser, for example. I just want to show you a bit, because the, the first film was more of an overview. This is more a chance to see what it looks like from a brand's perspective, for example. And I think this um, gives us a chance to think about you know, the, the type of public health um, issues and harmful use of alcohol that happens. Gender-based violence is another huge one. Um, you know, for example, in South Africa, um, you know, a, a brand like Carling Black Label was a brand that actually has stood for masculinity and celebrating champion men, is actually thinking about how you can tackle toxic masculinity as an underlying causes for gender-based violence, for example, and, and instituting and embedding, for example, real values um, under, um, you know, for, for, for men so that they can rethink what it means to be a champion man and that you no longer see gender-based violence as something that um, is acceptable. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I want to end on this very small film just to put it back into perspective, the kind of work that some of these brands are currently doing. And then we can talk a little bit about results, 
and the reason why AB InBev is actually doing this. South Africa's government and its essential care providers were leading the fight against COVID-19. Some civilians found themselves imprisoned, fighting against the shadow pandemic of gender-based violence. South African Police Service received 87,000 gender-based violence complaints during the first week of South Africa's 21-day national lockdown. Together with Lifeline South Africa, Father a Nation, Takawane Rime, and the Department of Social Development, Carling Black Label added a WhatsApp line to their hashtag No Excuse initiative. Victims and the survivors are locked in with the abusers. So with the WhatsApp, it's easier to communicate with us, it's easier to get help. We are bringing the help to your hand so that information is more available and accessible to the person that is being abused and the person that is doing the abuse so they can get the help that they need, whether counseling, mentorship, or if you're looking for information. It's not a campaign for men, it's a societal campaign. It takes both men and women in making sure that we fight gender-based violence in our society. Men also need to call the act. They want to talk to someone because they want to change their behavior. They notice that whatever that they are doing is wrong. They regret abusing their fact that they want to change and do the right thing. There's so many men who would not have reached out for help, have reached out for help, and so many women have benefited as a, resu as a result of it. Maybe been saved from an abusive situation. So statistically, it's been a tremendous, tremendous success. The WhatsApp line has helped thousands of South Africans to get help in a way they couldn't before. But the work is far from over. The reports of continued brutal violence against women is a call to arms, to stand up and take action against the scourge of gender-based violence. Fighting gender-based violence takes bravery. Bravery to talk about it, bravery to report it, and most importantly, bravery to take action. Hashtag no excuse, because there is no excuse for abuse. Um, well, I hope somehow you had a, a bit of a taste of the kind of campaigns we're talking about and the importance to think about brands and obviously to think about it you know, and, and why is ABM Bev doing that? But I'd love to hear from Michelle and Michelle, maybe, you know, we shared a little bit about what we're going to do, for example, with the marketeers, but I'd love to hear from you. So why exactly is ABM Bev doing this? What's, what's in it for them to be able to actually drive this at the highest level and to get you to sit here today to talk about basically limiting the way people drink? Hi, Miriam. Thank you for, for having us here today and for having me here talking to you. And I think that the, maybe the, the most straight way to answer your question to start with is because we care, because I care, right? And I think that we should all think that uh, th there was a time in which companies could work, could develop their businesses, could be isolated from what happens in society. And this time is gone, it's part of the past. So today we need to see ourselves as part of the society with all the benefits and all the problems of being part of the communities have. And our company especially, because we, we operate with big operations in more than 50 countries and we have our products uh, being commercialized, sold, being part of people's life in more than 200 countries, there is no way that we can think about the future of our company and imagine the role that we have in society without being part of the conversations and being part of the solutions that needs to be developed in each and every society. So I, I always welcome this type of dialogue and this part uh, of my job, which I enjoy a lot, which is talking to people, listening and learning from them. And in, in our case, when you think about the, the problem, right? So we, we can't deny that uh, harmful consumption is a problem in society. And is harmful consumption of alcohol is not harmful consumption of beer. So beer is part of the set of alcoholic beverages that can be in a way part of the problem 
but in a much broader way, in our uh, way of thinking, can be part of the solution. And we see ourselves as being part of the communities, of being part of this problem, and therefore being an agent in helping with the solution. And beer can be part of the solution uh, for several different reasons. I think that is based on the reach that we have and the scale of the company that we manage in how much our brands are part of the fabric and the day-to-day uh, of our consumers globally, on how much we invest in marketing and advertisement uh, to grow and build our brands. And therefore, when we dedicate part of this communication, part of the way that we build these brands uh, to communicate what is the right thing to do. And I think that another reason is we care. The second is because it's the right thing to do. And when we do this in the right way, we actually, we don't limit consumption. We want to limit harmful consumption. And this is very different. Right? We want to make sure that people are enjoying life, are celebrating, are taking care of themselves. And we do everything in our reach to do that. From innovation, from lower alcohol products, which is one more reason why beer needs and can be part of the solution. There is a big difference between brewed liquids and distilled liquids, high content alcohol liquids and low content alcohol liquids. And we think we disagree with this idea that a drink is a drink, right? So this is a wrong way of advertising things, right? We believe that because we are part of the problem and we have reach and scale, we can also be part of the solution. And that's why all our brands, they have this responsible drinking uh, work stream. And we invest on that for more than 20 years, billions of dollars. It's not millions, it's billions of dollars uh, in the last 20 years invested on that everywhere. We do this from China to the US to Brazil is one of the most exciting parts of our branding communications and our branding team's work is responsible drinking, is smart drinking. Thank you so much. I, I, I mean, I, this all resonates with me very much. And, and you know, I mean, we talked and I know you're a marketeer at heart. So I, I we wanted to share a bit this toolkit and a very small snippet just to see what we're trying to do. So t- t- can you maybe tell me a little bit how you see social norms actually really addressing this harmful, um, you know, drinking in your commercial communications and how are we going to be able to achieve? Do you see value in what, you know, we're trying to do the difference between individual social influencing and really taking that as a, as a, as an approach for, for, for the company? Yeah, I think that the, the work that you've been doing, uh, together with our team, with Bill, in analyzing all these campaigns and everything that's been done so far is an amazing work because brings visibility to a lot of things that we really believe and we've been doing for years and years. And now is becoming more evident as people understand the different ways in which you can build again, occasions, your brands, and the way that you can impact the society uh, through the advertisement dollars that you spend. And we all know that uh, people will react differently to different messages, right? You can say to someone that you cannot drink. You can say someone that you cannot drive at high speed. Uh, You can say someone that you cannot play video games for too long. And people don't like being told not to do something. But people sometimes engage and appreciate smart ways of connecting with them and providing them a message that's good for them in which they can feel good about doing. So you go to China today after seven, eight years that we do responsible drinking in China is a privilege in China to be the designated, designated driver. And this is a campaign that we copied in China from a campaign that started in the US several years ago, because we knew, uh, and we all know that, that when people drink, they should not drive. But when you are in a party with 10 friends, how can you tell someone not to drink? 
because they will be the designated driver. So we transformed this in a very cool concept in China, super related to the culture of the Chinese people. So they kind of do a luck draw at the beginning of the night to decide who is the designated driver. And this person is the one that receives the best treatment in the night in terms of food and attention from the friends because he will be taking care of the friends at the end of the night, right? So today people volunteer to be the designated driver. So when you introduce uh, water and hydration in between the beverages, beer essentially hydrates you when you are drinking. But you know that you can always hydrate more. And as you pace, it's good for you because then you give more time for alcohol and you consume less alcohol. But our impact is really when you think about other beverages that don't hydrate you, if people associate the behavior that they have when they drink Budweiser, when they drink other beverages, then you are extending this social behavior far beyond uh, only the, the drinking habits with Budweiser or with beer. And when you look at all the data that WHO has in terms of responsible consumption or harmful consumption, what you see is that the norms and the responsible consumption are winning over the last 10 years because all the indicators that WHO use, uh, accidents, diseases, deaths, they are actually going down. And this is the power of you investing over time on what is the right thing to do and what you believe that's the right thing to do and getting a large company like ours setting the norms for the future. So we like to be part of the solution we like to do what is the right thing to do, uh, and we like to invest long term. So that's why we think that this is the right thing to do. No, this is good, and this is coming. This is taking me straight to the, my next questions, which I'd like to ask maybe Leslie. And Leslie Crutchfield has been, you know, working um, over the last one year. We, you know, she she ran an evaluation on your smart drinking strategy for the last five years, and I think it's important to put this also into perspective that. Obviously, social norms is important, but there are you know, other elements, right? There's the guidance label, there's the, all the learnings of the city pilots, and there's obviously everything we're doing on non-alcoholic beer and innovations you're talking about in our products. But I'd love to hear from Leslie on you know, some of the lessons learned um, the, from this evaluation that ABM Bev can and should share and that are applicable across the industry, right? And, and if you can maybe mention a little bit around impact, the kind of impact that this transformational strategy over the last five years has actually had. Leslie, are you here? Yes, thank you, Miriam. Um, thank you so much for including me in this. And uh, I wanna say congratulations to you and uh, the co-authors of the AB Bev Smart Drinking Study, Karthik Isawar, who's on faculty at Georgetown McDonough School of Business, where I have the privilege of teaching, and also Bill Novelli, uh, who was the original founder of one of the first purpose forward communications and marketing companies in the world, Porto Novelli. Um, you and Bill and Karthik uh, really did an outstanding job with looking at the first five years of AB InBev's efforts to implement their global smart drinking goals and realize part of the vision of this billion dollar commitment that Michelle's predecessor, uh, Carlos Brito made a billion dollar commitment to reduce harmful drinking uh, by 2025. And um, we took a look, opened up the car, looked under the hood to, to see how it's going and what kind of impact AB and Bev has had. And importantly, what pivots, what adaptations could the company make and the foundation to be able to have more impact going in the future. And um, uh, as I share some of the insights, I, I just have to remark, it, it, I was struck by your video with the De Beers example of the diamonds, right? Uh, where, where it really changed the way we think about that product as integral to one of the you know, common rituals around the world of uh, getting engaged. And it brought me back to a time the very first time when I was at Harvard physically on campus, I was an undergraduate there in the uh, 1980s. And it reminded me that when I was visiting college uh, and applying, um, how the big uh, focus at that time was on apartheid. 
So there were shanty towns set up in Harvard Yard and all of the students were protesting apartheid in South Africa. It made me think just how much the world has changed in these last really two generations in terms of the relationship between business and society. Because when you think back to those apartheid uh, protests in the US, students were protesting, trying to get the US government to divest. We were trying to get Margaret Thatcher's UK to divest and we couldn't get government to divest. And so activists started looking to business saying, hey, divest from your operations, right? We got more than 200 companies from General Motors to many companies to stop doing business in South Africa as a strategy, right? Um, but in the time of the 70s and 80s, we thought about business as, um, you know, sometimes a target of activism, right? A target of protest. And that's kind of the mental model that was dominant, but move fast forward to today in the 2000s you know, 20s, um, we look to business, as Michelle was saying, as part of society, right? We can't solve any of the big complex challenges that we face as a world without having business at the table. And while this is an important insight, it is very uncomfortable, particularly for activists, NGOs, some public health leaders who, um, you know, aren't comfortable with the commercial interests that business brings. So so all of this is in the mix and in our background when we were doing our analysis of the company. And what we looked at was really how AB InBev at the end of the day was trying to and is trying to create shared value. You know, drawing on Michael Porter and Mark Kramer from Harvard Business School's insights into companies that go beyond traditional corporate social responsibility approaches and even philanthropy to change their very business operations in order to advance a cause, solve, solve a social or environmental problem. So Michelle, for instance, ex, you know, used the example of NAB Lab, the no and low alcohol beer products. This would be an example of the company innovating new products, renovating products so that consumers have new choices, different choices that allow them to have the lower or no alcohol option. Um, we took a look at that. Now, AB and Bev set a goal of um, having their no and low alcohol beers be a 20% sales by volume uh, during the course of this program. Um, and in the first five years, they made some progress. They were able to increase it from about 6.6 .6 to 7.4% of volume, but it really fell short of that 20% goal. So, you know, what this tells us in our evaluation is, you know, you've got the choices there for consumers, but the next step is how do you market those, right? And start to change norms and behaviors so that consumers are choosing those options. And that brings to the second insight, um, the impact of AB InBev's commitment to social norms marketing and in your world, Miriam, um, that you do so well. Um, the, let's just take the example of the Agala campaign. Uh, now this was the very popular beer brand in. Uh, Colombia, as you mentioned, and lots of Latin American cultures where you have one of the main harmful drinking behaviors is binge drinking, right? It's a party culture. And so the brand uh, campaigns would ha you know, have bottle caps uh, and then the bottom of the bottle cap, you could buy some fast food, get some food in your system while you're drinking or uh, coupons for water. So you can alternate water. And what um, and what we found in our study, as you well know, is that during the course of these campaigns, behaviors were changed. Consumers did adopt smarter drinking behaviors. So there was impact in the immediate near term. But the challenge is in the long term, once the campaign stops, consumers tend to revert back to their old behaviors. So while the near term behavior changed, the long term norm hadn't shifted. So that's another opportunity for AB and Bev as they think about investing the next part of this billion dollar commitment is how do you really stick with these campaigns over the long term so that you get those norm change that stick. And then the last area of impact I'll speak to is the city pilots. You mentioned the uh, AB and Bev Foundation put more than 150 million um, over the course of our study into six cities around the world doing philanthropic and public-private partnerships with governments and nonprofits trying to uh, reduce harmful drinking behaviors. Some of the uh, biggest successes were in, for instance, Zacatecas, Mexico, uh, where AB and Bev 
helped support a mystery shopper program in, in Zacatecas. You see a lot of underage drinking, selling beer and other forms of alcohol to minors, youth. Um, they worked with beverage providers, leveraging the supply chain uh, that the beer industry has so much influence over to close the bars earlier, uh, actually advocating for regulations so that the cities could close the bars earlier. That um, also cut down on harmful drinking and driving, right? Um, so you saw many uh, advancements impacting these communities. Again, it's a story of success. And yet, you know, it's, it's one city in one community. How do you scale these insights and bring it to other um, areas? Um, and I think one of the most interesting ahas that came from our research was, uh, first of all, ABM Bev really trying to use the whole assets of the entire company, the commercial side of the business, as well as the traditional philanthropy to advance the social um, objectives. And secondly, you saw AB and Bev leaning into advocacy, really becoming an advocate for better public health regulations, laws, and societies. And that becomes a very sticky issue um, because uh, we are familiar with companies lobbying in their own commercial interests. So it's very unfamiliar for society to see a company lobbying in some ways against its commercial interests for the public health. And I, I'm going to let Jane Nelson address some of those complexities because I know she's coming up next and has a lot of thoughts on that. Um, but that's just some high level insights from from our research. And uh, just thank you very much for this uh, very interesting overview of the report and some of the in interesting insights you found and the insightful points you delivered about the role of business in society. And thank you also to already uh, giving the word to, to Jane. I just want to frame the question a little bit more around this. Um, I'd love to go a bit further into the policy context of what we're talking about and would like to ask you, Jane, given your background in corporate social responsibility and creating shared value, can you tell us about the global policy environment that alcohol brands are operating within and um, should we really as a society allow the private sector and with that the beer industry instead of the public sector to fund campaigns to reduce unhealthy drinking? Great. Yeah, well, well, thank you. Thank you, Svenja. And um, very good to be here as, as part of this um, discussion. And I'd like to outline what I think are sort of four critical interconnected levels of policy and governance and oversight, which, which I think all four of them are crucial to ensuring um, responsible and smart drinking. And firstly, I'd like to start with global policy frameworks, and most notably, obviously, the World Health Organization, WHO. And I think we've seen some very important um, changes there, and, you know, particularly over the last decade, three seminal global frameworks that I think have become crucial to the overall both conversation and oversight on responsible drinking. In, 20, um, in 2010, WHO launched its sort of first ever global strategy to reduce the harmful um, use of alcohol. And then followed up in 2018 with what it calls its safer framework, which is sort of a set of um, more specific pillars around you know, availability, advertising, um, you know, taxation, etc. So sort of a, a, a more specific roadmap in terms of what you know, governments and public health officials can, can do in this area. And um, I think a third very important framework uh, that the WHO has invested a lot of time and, and global engagement in is the um, non-communicable diseases, the NCD uh, global monitoring framework, and has made um, you know, alcohol an element of that along with other non-communicable diseases. So, so I think there's a there's now a, a you know over the last decade a, a, a mosaic of global frameworks that governments, public health officials, and companies and, and activists can, can adhere to. The second, obviously, crucially important level is what I'd call national and subnational, including city level um, governance, policy, and oversight. And, and obviously, by you know, definition, there's a bit of a patchwork here of, of different um, sort of initiatives and, and policies and regulations underway. But I think there are four key levers that, that both national and city level and subnational governments have. Clearly, very importantly, are sort of mandates and regulations. And there, um, you know, you you uh, you know mentioned um, it was uh, you, Miriam, the sort of the impact of the 21 year 
uh, you know, um, uh, age limits on, on drinking. So you're putting age limits, putting you know, restrictions on where you can purchase, who can purchase, making drunk driving a criminal offense. So you're sort of prescriptive mandates, regulations around responsible drinking. Secondly, incentives and disincentives. And obviously, you have fiscal incentives, um, you know, um, ta taxation and, and, and other fiscal incentives and, and pricing around, around um, alcohol purchasing and pricing, information disclosure requirements, um, and you know, what companies and, and, um, and, and retailers can and, and cannot um, you know, advertise the whole area of labeling. And then um, you know, finally partnerships. And Leslie gave a great example of those city partnerships. You know, how can, particularly at the local level, municipal governments partner um, you know, with the companies? So you've got sort of global governance frameworks. You have sort of national level um, your know, mandates, incentives, disclosure requirements, and, and uh, your, uh, partnerships, particularly at the local and city level. The third, I think, sort of very important level then is industry-wide self-regulation. And I think, again, we've seen enormous progress in the, in the, in the um, you know, sort of last decade here with you know, the International Alliance for Responsible Drinking, um, which was formed in 2015, but came from several decades of the industry, both you know, beer, wine and spirits working together. And I think it's now, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of 12 of the world's largest companies working through this, um, you know, this global alliance, which coming to your point on, Leslie, when it comes to advocacy, um, you know, if it's done in a transparent way, it can play an important role, um, uh, you know, as, as well as what individual companies are doing. But so that sort of voluntary industry self-regulation, which is which is very valuable, but not enough without those those other levels. And then finally, the fourth level, um, you know, very quickly is at the company level itself. And you know, what is the company doing to govern? <laughs> Um, it's, and have you know, its own policies and governance frameworks for responsible and smart drinking. And you know, we've already you know, heard sort of some, I think, the key factors for, for not, not just success, but credibility here. You know, is there publicly disclosed and time bound goals and targets that the company has put out there? Is it reporting on those on a regular basis? Is that reporting independently assured and verified? Are there, you know, other evaluations underway? Is there board level oversight? Um, is there a long-term commitment, not just a, a short-term commitment? And then I, I think very importantly, as Leslie pointed out, you know, how is the company using all of its assets um, to that, um, you know, to achieve those goals, not just its sort of philanthropy assets or just its marketing assets, but all of its assets. So I think those four levels of governance and, and, and policy are, are crucial um, to, to moving the agenda forward. And then, you know, to your question very quickly, where the companies themselves should be, um, you know, out there doing the advertising, I think one, you know, it, it's a, you know, one really has to balance and, you know, Michelle, I think captured it you know, brilliantly, when you look at the, the sheer global scale and reach of any of the, you know, the, 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 the large global consumer goods companies and certainly AB and InBev and the, 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 the creativity, the investment, the money that goes into global advertising and marketing, you know, the power of, of, of those platforms and those brands um, to influence social norms as longer term and behavior shorter term is immense, but it needs oversight and you know, good governance both by the company itself but by those other sort of three levels of the um, you know, uh, industry-wide uh, initiatives, uh, national and, and city level and, um, and sort of global governance frameworks. So, and you know, things like you know, ad, um, you know, sort of advertising standards, et cetera, um, playing a role. But um, yeah, so, so I think we've seen great progress in the last decade and it's that long-term commitment that's gonna be crucial going forward. No, absolutely. Thank you so much also for talking about credibility. I think that is one of the main issues that we in society are always very worried about when we handle a responsibility over something as crucial as a public health issue to the private sector. And with that, I would like to get to Bill because he's our uh, panelist here who um, has a lot of experience in the space of public health and also especially alcohol control. Uh, I would love to have you provide us with some insights also in the context of Les what Leslie and Jane were speaking about with regards to the role of business and society. Um, generally, Bill, what evidence have you seen of alcohol companies' success in reducing uh, the harmful use of alcohol? And also in that context, what are learnings and limitations from working with the industry towards advancing a public health goal as such, such as reducing the harmful use of alcohol um, are there from your point of view? Thank you. 
Okay, so by training, I'm a researcher. And so when you say what evidence is there, I immediately think in terms of highly structured, rigorous research. That doesn't exist for company initiatives. But in any case, my point of view about all this is that it's best for the alcohol industry to work in sync with public health programs and uh, policies to reduce alcohol harms. And in many cases, this just means um, supporting, endorsing programs and policies that public health experts uh, have recommended based on their research. Now, one example is the designated driver. Um, so I was privileged to work at the Harvard School of Public Health in the late 80s. And in the Center for Health Communication, we um, started to promote the idea of using a designated driver, which back then was a wholly new concept for the American public. Nobody knew what this was. And we worked with the Hollywood entertainment community to get them to mention the designated driver in their shows, to show people picking a designated driver. Uh, <clears throat> back in the day, there was only three major television networks and all three agreed to develop and air PSAs that would promote the designated driver. Well, it took off from there, as we all know, and we heard uh, Michelle talk about introducing it to China. Um, there's a Harvard Business School case study showing that introducing this idea of the designated driver definitely contributed meaningfully to a reduction in alcohol-related traffic crashes in the United States. Anheuser-Busch, before it was acquired, uh, is now part of uh, ABM Bev, was one of the first companies to jump on the bandwagon and use a lot of their advertising dollars to promote the designated driver. So they were part of that overall effort. Um, there's a type of social norms marketing that I want to describe where ABM Bev also played a seminal role in the beginning. Um, in my field of alcohol prevention among college students, we refer to social norms marketing to mean a very specific thing. And that is correcting students' misperceptions of what the drinking norms are at their campus. Um, it's been demonstrated in hundreds of schools in the United States and increasingly in universities elsewhere in the world that students have a very exaggerated misperception about how much drinking, how much heavy drinking is going on. Um, people who started to focus on this said it's as if college students are um, responding to imaginary peers and feeling peer pressure. Um, so the idea was if we can correct those misperceptions that students would realize they don't have to drink heavily to fit in, which is their misconception. Now, initially there were four universities that tried this for years. People have been trying different things to reduce heavy drinking and its consequences, nothing seemed to work. They tried this approach of a marketing campaign that would simply correct the norms and they appeared to have success. Um, now on the basis of that, uh, Anheuser-Busch established uh, the Social, National Social Norms Institute first at Northern Illinois University. It's presently supported by the AB InBev Foundation at Michigan State University. Now this whole approach, especially after Anheuser-Busch uh, supported it, was very controversial among my public health colleagues. Um, they thought it was a ploy to minimize the apparent severity of the problem and therefore undermine support for public policy. Um, Henry Wexler, um, my former colleague at the Harvard School of Public Health, denounced the whole effort as uh, a tool of big alcohol. And I was running a center at the time that endorsed this approach. I'm a social psychologist. I understand how normative pressure works. And I was decried, my center was decried as a tool of big alcohol uh, in his book. Um, well, when it's done properly, it works. It reduces uh, heavy drinking, it reduces consequences. And in fact, there's so much research demonstrating that, that the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism has now recognized it as an evidence-based practice. So again, um, 
I, I can't tease apart Anheuser Busch and now AB InBev's contribution to this, but it definitely was there. Um, so and I think moving forward, there are many other opportunities for a company to um, you know, work with people in public health. It is a, a magic moment when I think the interests of AB InBev and other alcohol producers coincide with a lot of public health goals. I, I will quickly add, not all of them, and we'll keep talking about that. Um, in terms of learning, so I think um, I'm going to turn to the city pilots, and um, the Zacatecas um, ended up being the best of the city pilots, uh, but it was largely because a program officer was hired by the AB InBev Foundation, who really knew how to make things happen. She was politically well connected. She had her own social uh, media company, um, and she knew how to work the politics and move things forward. Uh, in the beginning, um, as Leslie described, there were some efforts that the company itself uh, was able to push. But as soon as a, a community task force got involved and people had to decide as a group um, what to work on, things really slowed down. Um, you know, as a practical matter, it's very hard to get a large number of people with conflicting interests and different levels of knowledge and information to agree on what to do. Um, and as I could take us, somebody stepped in who became much more directive. So now uh, the ABM Foundation um, has really zeroed in on some of the best evidence-based practices and learning from their own experiences with the city pilots. Uh, to promote road safety programs, screening and brief interventions, responsible beverage service programs. Uh, and they're doing this by supporting staff in selected markets to take the lead in getting these programs in place, working with local stakeholders. But um, th there's no task force trying to decide what to do. The company has its goals. They are good public health goals focused on evidence-based practices and they're going to make it happen. Um, you know, I think there are two limitations that I would point to. And one is that um, AB InBev has grown by acquiring a lot of different breweries from around the world. And from a business standpoint, it continues to make sense to let these different breweries uh, operate with a great deal of autonomy. Um, but for the kinds of initiatives that the company wanted to pursue, I, I'm not really sure that a decentralized management model works very well. And I think through introducing key performance indicators for the zone managers, the brand managers, um, that more progress uh, could be made. I would say the other limitation is really not um, the company's fault. Um, it's really the resistance from public health colleagues who um, just absolutely cannot tolerate people who try to work with the alcohol industry. Um, there's a lot of bullying that goes on and um, it, it gets in the way, um, but that's not the company's fault. All it can do is continue to do good work with the people who are willing to work with them and prove the critics incorrect. Thank you so much, Bill. I think it's a great important word um, here about the public health skepticism, because I think it's a, it can be a real blocker. It's very important to keep, obviously, um, you know, companies and private sector accountable to whatever goals they've set up. But there's a difference between that and actually, um, you know, the skepticism that comes in the way. So it's about finding the right balance. And I, I, I obviously want to be able to respond to some of the Q&As and address the Q&As in the audience, because we have some amazing questions. But um, maybe here, just very quickly, uh, you know, I want to go back to Michelle and, you know, he's heard from everyone at the moment, right? Where do we go from here? Like, where, where you know, like, how do we see the, you know, the future of brands in promoting this, you know, positive social behavior in your industry and beyond? I mean, there's been so much said in terms of obviously what we can do from a policy level at you know country level global level inter-industry conversation some of the learnings that we've done some opportunities that are out there and um, you know and some of the key learnings in terms of working with the public sector and public health professionals even more so wh where do we go from here what you know what how do you see the future um and i think if you could just give us a, 
you know, a final word before we open up a bit to Q&A. And I know we're getting close to time, but I thought, um, you know, a, a final word from you as a wrap up of this would be great. Well, thank you. Uh, and very interesting, all the, the conversation. I think that uh, in a way, if I could say what I see uh, as the future is really about moderation. And I think that when you think about social norms and what we are trying to fight against, right? So we don't want to have harmful consumption and the harmful consumption comes in several different ways from illicit alcohol to binging drinking to underaging drinking to drinking and driving. And when you think about what WHO does and measures this helps us in understanding that over the last 10 years, there was a lot of progress that was made. And therefore, we should continue to invest behind science, behind things that are working and can be scaled. And you always will see companies that are leading the way and others that at one point in time will need to follow. So we would like to be on the leading side of that because we believe it's the right thing to do and we want to do things right and we will continue to invest on that. And when I think about beer and this future of moderation, I think that beer is well suited to help in this future because beer is flexible in terms of formulation so it can go low alcohol, no alcohol, Beer, as we know, is not a hard liquor, and therefore the consumption, when you compare countries that are more hard liquor-led or beer-led, you see that all these problems, they actually are much smaller when you have a prevalence of beer uh, in, in the consumption of alcohol. And because we want our consumers to be healthy, we want them to be uh, drinkers that drink with moderation and our commitment to continue to drive norms and to invest behind that is unwavering. So we'll continue to do that as we move forward. And we are happy with what's happening, but we know that there is much more to be done. That's why we'll continue to, to look for more opportunities to learn, more people that can collaborate with us. And I think that you, you touch upon one point that's very important. The more public and private se sector work together, the better the solutions will be, right? So we'll be always open to cooperate and to work together with people that they have uh, the same objectives in mind, in this case, to reduce harmful consumption. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I know we're looking, we're getting close to the end of our time, but we want to be able to address at least two questions from the audience. So if I'm going to ask the panelists to just give us a few minutes, because um, I think, you know, they've been patiently listening to us. So I think this is this is a bit their time also to, to, to address some of their questions. So Svenja, maybe can we pick two questions um, yes. and then see if we can get a chance to at least get the responses to two questions. Sure. Uh, one question that I found very interesting in the Q&A, there were a lot of interesting questions just uh, to begin with. Um, with the onset of COVID and lockdowns, of course, people were increasingly at home and also increasingly drinking at home. So there was a changing social context around that. Um, is that kind of on your agenda as well, um, doing, doing research surrounding this issue and also as a company from that sector side? Um, Wow, how can one um, encourage smarter drinking also in the context of being at home with COVID and lockdowns? Shall we, shall we I guess Michelle and Bill could be the best um, two to respond to this question. Uh, let me go first, uh, if I may. Um, a lot of the specific behaviors that Anheuser-Busch InBev is promoting under the banner of social norms marketing are designed to help people avoid overconsumption, avoid bringing their blood alcohol level to a dangerous uh, point. Um, so hydration, alternating um, 
alcoholic beverages, with non-alcohol beverages of any type, um, eating before drinking, having food available and eating while drinking. There are a whole list of, of these kinds of behaviors. And they would apply it if you're drinking at home by yourself or if you're out with friends. Um, the other thing that the company is working on is a set of um, voluntary alcohol labels. And some of them will remind people um, you know, what the, the limit is for um, somebody of their gender. Um, <clears throat> so that's another way of getting that message out, um, regardless of where people are drinking. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I know John has a question. So John, over to you. Uh, so this is really for Michelle, but I'd be curious in other people's perspective as well. Um, you know, there was some discussion earlier about shared value. And of course, if you can show that there are benefits to the company, uh, for example, on a performance metric uh, and tied back to shareholders, tied back to the positive growth and performance of the company, and it's also socially beneficial, those are the kind of easy cases, if you will. Those are the ones where the choices are not hard and some, at some level, and there may be an educational component to it. Um, but the ones that are really hard are when there's a trade-off between what would be socially beneficial and potentially damaging to the financial performance of the company. And one of the questions in the, in the, in the question box was basically, how do you make some of those uh, trade-offs for the company? How do you take for, you know, if some of the things you're talking about may reduce consumption um, and that could be damaging to the growth of, of uh, AB InBev, um, but at the same time, it has the social benefits that you've outlined, Michelle. And I admire you, I admire what you're doing uh, tremendously because I can imagine those not, are not necessarily easy conversations with your board um, and with other investors. And so how do you handle and manage that discussion with your board, with your structure, when you make your strategic choices, when you make your strategic plans, kind of laying out the actions you're gonna take? Let me take this in, in twofold, because I think that's a very interesting topic for us to talk about. So the first one is like, there is zero conflict in my mind or in ABI's mind when we make a choice between harmful consumption versus profitability, right? So we love our brands, we love our consumers, we believe that our job is to provide high quality products to them. If I would use a very simple concept, right? Maybe uh, this idea of customer lifetime that is very used today in technology companies. We don't want any consumer that has a behavior of binging drinking that might damage his own life or other people's lives or the image of our products. We would rather have our products uh, being used in moderation for a very long time by our consumers so they can have a productive and healthy life than having binging or harmful consumption. That's why the conflict is zero. The harmful consumption and the heavy users of products that cause harmful consumption, they are a small part of our business, almost inexistent to our profits, and they don't make any difference to the company. That's why we are very deliberative in the way that we uh, communicate against that and try to leverage our scale and our resources to do that. In the same way, if you think about this idea of partnerships, when you do the right things and you advocate in the right direction, then things can be actually very good for the business, right? Because if you think about uh, differentiation, for example, higher alcohol and lower alcohol beverages, or the ability to the industry to promote, advertise, and commercialize lower alcohol products. You see countries like the UK, for example, they benefit beverages that are sold with lower alcohol dosage because they know that there is just so much that people can drink. So if you are able to take this and transform on a business opportunity, then you are using public, 
and private partnerships or directions to benefit the whole society. And this differentiation topic to me in harmful consumption is a topic that we cannot forget. I think that for too long, there is this idea that a drink is a drink. And I would love to understand where this comes from, right? Because you just need to look at a glass of wine or a full cocktail and you see that this is not true because people do this idea of a drink is a drink with 1.5 ounces of alcohol that is not in any cocktail or in any cup that you drink a hard liquor. But this became like the verbiage uh, across regulators today. And you have cases like the Russia case where beer consumption went up and other alcohol consumptions went down and then the harmful usage went down associated to that. So I think that in twofold. So we have no doubts what is the right thing to do. And that's why we will continue to invest. There's no dilemma here. There is no losses of profitability in doing what is the right thing to do. And on the other hand, I think that on the regulation side, moderation is a very important thing. Differentiation is a very important thing. And incentives, I mean, stimulus in terms of legislation for lower alcohol content products is something that's very helpful. Terrific. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, clearly um, you found the shared value and the long-term perspective on your consumers is quite interesting. And I see that in other, a lot of other areas in particular, if you look at somebody like a Larry Fink at BlackRock, he's, he's managing retirement funds, which basically he has to invest for the long term. He has trillions of dollars invested mm -hmm. in index funds, so he can't pick discrete companies to choose not to invest in. And so he has to build a very sustainable long-term kind of system uh, that, that uh, can be supported. So it's interesting your comment about the li lifetime value, which it, it seems quite constructive. It would be good if perhaps some more companies took that approach in view. And on that note, I would like to thank all of our participants, all of our attendees, also especially um, Michelle Dukers, the CEO of AB InBev. Uh, thank you all for joining today. I hope we can keep the conversation going and uh, I hope you have a great uh, winter break, especially those students. And uh, thank you again. Um, it was a pleasure. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.